Okay, round two. Ooh. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's so nice to see everybody again. Bright eyed and bushy tailed. Uh, the weather is, of course, gray and cloudy. Um, so, I'm not going to paint the sunniest picture, but let me paint an accurate picture about what's going on um, in DC. So, first of all, as we know, Congress has adjourned for the rest of this Congress. They're all back in the districts campaigning, trying to convince voters that they should be able to keep their job. And let me tell you, we have three friends here uh, from Columbus in Pat T. Berry, Steve Stivers, and Joyce Beatty. They are wonderful on our issues, but also they're on the key committees that really have significant impact on our issues before they get to the full House floor. So let me tell you what we're working on. Right now, um, again, nothing's going to get done until what we refer to as lame duck session. And it's essentially the period of time after the elections until the new Congress gets sworn in in 2015. So basically, for those losers or for those who retire, they can take votes without retribution, hence the name lame duck. Um, we certainly think it's a very important, important part of session, though, and we have some priorities that we need to get across the finish line. Um, some of those things I will, the ticking time clock things I'll hit in a second, but I just want to talk about one of the biggest priorities that we have to continue to communicate on, and that is the important issue of tax reform. Right now, real estate has some pretty preferential tax treatment, um, knowing that it's really sound public policy, that it builds communities, that it, it is a way for families of moderate means to invest in their well-being. Um, but, so the status of this is that it's unlikely to move at all in Linga. We're looking at uh, the 114th Congress or beyond. However, lawmakers must remember that you know real estate plays a very vital role in not only the local but national economy. And any comprehensive tax reform legislation that they propose needs to do no harm to housing. That's the main message. Um, this Congress, though, the conversation did get started. We had some discussion drafts come out in both the House and the Senate. And it's important to note, you know, the sky is not falling today. These are discussion drafts. There are no bill numbers assigned to it. However, it is an opening mark of where this discussion begins, and it's important that we engage. There are a few um, real estate tax provisions that are in both versions of, or one or the other version of these tax reform proposals. And the biggest one, and you probably hear this from me every single time, we've been talking about protecting the mortgage interest deduction for some time. And right now in the House draft, uh, it would eliminate the mortgage interest deduction for about 95% of homeowners. Um, and again, this is, this is with the promise of lower rates, but we don't have to look too far back to sort of the hyperinflation of the market. And remember those teaser rates? Yep. So I, I like to refer to this as a teaser rate. You know, we don't want to bargain away mortgage interest deduction now for, for the promise of lower tax rates when we know that those rates can just as easily go up in a few years down the line, once you know anything would be on the table. Now it's important to know that the mortgage interest deduction is a strong middle class benefit. 75% uh, of homeowners utilize the mortgage interest deduction over the course of their mortgage. And NAR strongly, you, there should be nobody in this room that knows that NAR uh, we strongly oppose limiting or eliminating this important tax provision. It's been in the tax code for over 100 years. Next, state and local property tax deduction. Another really important one, and this is actually uh, the one that the biggest, this is the biggest tax deduction for most homeowners. So, very important. Um, in the house draft, it would actually eliminate the state and local property tax deduction for all homeowners. Um, the Senate version does not touch it. Uh, however, you know, we like to remind folks that considering property taxes paid as real income, is really just a funny way of saying it's double taxation. And we need to remind our lawmakers uh, that that is the case. NAR strongly supports um, keeping the property, state and local property tax deduction in place. And then finally, another one, and this, I talked to a lot of folks after our event last night, but the 1031 like kind exchange. And fortunately, this is in, uh, up for elimination, or at least we're t they're talking about ways that they can get to tax reform. Um, by eliminating the like kind exchange. This is eliminated in both House and Senate draft right now. Um, this long standing provision allows real estate investment uh, to be exchanged for a property of a like kind on a tax deferred basis. And it's a key part of a large percentage of investment real estate transactions. 
not only for the commercial side, but I know for personal sides, uh, a lot of you in the room have investment uh, properties that, that this would affect. Um, it basically provides liquidity to an illiquid asset, and we believe strongly that this is sound public policy and needs to remain intact. So those are just, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot in these discussion drafts, and certainly we're going to be at the table uh, encouraging smart reform of the tax code. But again, we need to stress to our lawmakers that they must do no harm to housing provisions in the tax code. So fast forward to those ticking time provisions that I was talking about, the things that are going to expire or already have expired. Well, first and foremost, we have a very important tax extender that expired on January 1st of this year, and that's the mortgage cancellation uh, provision in the tax code. So basically what that does is if anybody does a short sale or a workout, that portion of principal that they were short or forgiven, um, before 2007 it was considered ordinary income by the IRS, really sort of kicking somebody when they're down. Uh, but after 2007, Congress addressed the issue, seeing the uptick in, in foreclosures, and we all know that you know going through a short sale or workout, keeping a family in a home or, or allowing them to sort of move on gracefully um, is far preferable to you know getting them into the foreclosure system. Um, so Congress addressed that issue in 2007 and exempted that portion of principal forgiven from ordinary income uh, for taxation purposes. That expired at the end of this year. I'm sorry, at the beginning of this year, we're working with Congress to extend it, not only retroactively through the first of this year, but we'd like for them to also extend it through the uh, end of 2015, so we're not back in the same position just again in January 1, 2015. The good news is that congressional leaders have signaled their support for this. We just need to keep the pressure on and keep communicating to them that you know there are still six million homeowners across the country that are underwater, and there's still 1.1 million homeowners that are going through foreclosure. So this is still a real issue that we need to act on and give folks the certainty that if they're in this situation, that they're not going to be slapped with a tax bill at the end of it. So again, NAR strongly supports retroactively extending this through the end of 2015, and we hope to get some movement on this in the lame duck session. And then finally, another provision that expires at the end of this year, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002. Uh, there were, a, I love seeing a lot of commercial practitioners in the room, um, and we had quite a few at our major investor event last night, which was awesome. Um, but for those of you who do that business, you know that TRIA is what we call it for short, just because it's a tongue twister. Uh, but TRIA is vital to securing commercial financing. And the reason that it's important to extend it is because by the nature of the attacks, terrorism is meant to be unpredictable, even so, even more so than flood insurance, you know. Um, and it's, unfortunately, we did have a, a national day of remembrance on 9-11, but if you look back even further, Oklahoma City, uh, these, these attacks really can happen anywhere. Um, and the reason that TRIA is important, the way it works is it provides a government backstop that allows small mid-sized mid insurers across the country, no matter what market you're in, to be able to provide this. And it's critical to getting schools and hospitals built in addition to the, uh, you know, the, the malls and the, the shopping centers. So it really is critical for local development. Um, however, so this is another lame duck priority that we're trying to get past. The House and the Senate are pretty far apart on where they are right now with it. The Senate passed a pretty bipartisan bill in July by 93 to 4, and if you know the U.S. Senate, very rarely do they agree on something other than naming something or a resolution um, by 93 to 4. So we have a solid bill there. It, re it um, reauthorizes the program for seven years and raises the recovery amount. So that is the amount that insurers have to cover before this federal backstop kicks in by $10 uh, billion. Yes, billion with a B. Lots of money. Um, so it does reform the program a little bit, and it provides for a long-term extension. In the House, however, they're taking a little bit of a different tack. Um, the committee passed out of committee a proposal that was on party line. Um, so it's become a little, just a little more polarized over there. Um, but it, re it reauthorizes the program for five years um, and increases the trigger amount. So the amount of losses that are required from a sanctioned terrorist attack from $100 million to $500 million. Um, it bifurcates the treatment of conventional 
I, I never thought I'd be talking about this, but conventional terrorism attacks versus new age, so that's the nuclear, radiological, biological um, attacks. And then most importantly, the biggest concern that we probably have is it creates a, an opt-out provision for small insurers. So as we know, the reason why we like the program as it is now is because it provides um, cover for all the small mid-sized insurers across the country to be able to provide this everywhere. And as you know, if you allow folks to opt out, um, that, that definitely diminishes the impact that the program can have nationally. So we are concerned um, with some of those little provisions in there, but the good news is that both chambers are working on it, and we're going to continue to meet with both, uh, both chambers, leaders in both chambers, and we're going to try to get them to yes um, in this lame duck session on some sort of, you know, compromise legislation in the middle that is sound for commercial real estate. So with that being said, you know, there's a whole host of other things we're working on. Those are just the really big provisions that are out there right now. Um, we're obviously still, we have a seat at the table working on Fannie and Freddie reform. Huge, huge issue right there. Um, we're working on protecting rural communities access to credit. We had a nice win with the passage of the farm bill over the summer that protected about 900 communities from being kicked out um, basically due to population size and the definition of what constitutes a rural community. We're still working on a 40 year old definition of what a rural community is. So uh, we're going to continue to work on that, but those communities have still have access to the program through the 2020 census. So we have some time to get to a real workable solution. Um, again, drones. We're going to be working with the FAA on commercial use of, of drones and what's sanctioned. And we're working with the FCC on net neutrality and making sure we maintain a free and open internet um, because a lot of our business has now shifted uh, and will be shifted even more into the, into the uh, sort of electronic internet space there. And then finally, waters of the U.S. We are working, um, unfortunately, you know, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers came out with a little unscientific proposal to try to expand their reach of what constitutes the waters of the U.S. Um, we're working with them to voice our concerns to make sure it's rooted in scientific evidence uh, that if they want to, you know, oversee a body of water, that in fact they have to prove it, not the property owner, because we know that that could potentially pass on a huge amount of costs to property owners when you, whether it's a prairie pothole or whether it's a. a a divot in your yard that fills up with rainwater every time it rains, we want to make sure that the property owner is protected and that the EPA has to prove that that is indeed a water of the U.S. and not the other way around, where everybody's you know, now getting appraisals and, and sort of certifications and things like that. So with that being said, thank you for your time. Uh, I, please stay, stay involved. For those of you who do give to CORPAC, we appreciate your commitment. We cannot do it without you. And certainly, you know, be involved on the federal level, but we all know that everything starts locally. So thank you for the hard work that Brent and Stan do and Ida. Um, certainly you have one of the best uh, local association staffs that I work with in the United States. So it's a, such a pleasure. I'll be around if anybody has questions afterwards, but thanks so much.